Hello and welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for joining us here for our next topic, digital running through public veins. Allow me to introduce the moderator for this session, Jasmine Ng, co-founder, Endgame and secretary, Access Blockchain of Malaysia, who will be introducing our esteemed panelists for today. Over to you, Jasmine. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, everyone. How are you guys doing today? I'm so glad to see each of you here joining us for this session. Now, I'm going to be privileged to be sharing and, and moderating this session with two really esteemed speakers. First, first up, let me introduce Dr. Avik Sakha. He heads up the development of India Data Portal, and uh, which is a one-stop portal for analysis and visualization of government data specifically working on societal aspects related to use of emerging tech like trustworthiness, ethics and privacy at the Indian School of Business. He was also the former head of data analytics cell and officer on special duty at the National Institute for Transforming India at the IO. So please uh, welcome Dr. Avi and the other gentleman, I think um, some of you may have already heard him speak on other sessions. Mr. Chavi, who comes from Estonia, he is Estonia's first ever Chief Information Officer and his accolades um, in helping Estonia and also planning and executing Estonia's digital uh, roadmap and advancing into a digital nation has made Estonia an enviable um, government with the digital services that it has deployed over the years. So welcome, welcome. Uh, Mr. Tavi, welcome, Dr. Avi. If I could invite you to also share a little bit about yourself before we jump straight into the question, uh, Dr. Avi. Yeah, so thanks, uh, Jasmine. It's, uh, it's really nice to be uh, with you and um, and Dr. Tavi on this panel. Uh, last year, we were fortunate that we could uh, attend this event in person. Uh, this year, it's virtual uh, because of the current COVID situation. And could, the networking part, I think, is the missing one. But um, I think technology is here to help us here. Uh, so a little bit of uh, background about myself. I spent about uh, 16 to 18 years uh, on the development of uh, solutions on big data, data science, and AI uh, in the corporate world, which was primarily with consulting companies and product development companies across Accenture, IBM, Nokia, and several others. Also, a couple of startups. And then I moved to head the data analytics division in Government of India. And this was primarily the planning division. And then in the Niti Aayog is the planning division. So basically, how you use data and big data and how you can use it effectively for policy making and better decision making. That was the primary objective that I was working. So I was working as a horizontal function, uh, serving to different verticals, healthcare, education, energy, uh, a, a few other ones. And, um, and currently, um, I, I, I teach on those aspects uh, to policymakers at the Indian School of Business and, and also engage a lot with several states and the central government in India on various policy matters. Uh, so some of the uh, there, there are a lot of things happening in India, primarily from a digital India perspective. Uh, the AI uh, roadmap was uh, one we tried to develop and we're now trying to operationalize it. So a lot of things happening on those uh, front on the on, on in India and trying to do bits and pieces of the of the whole puzzle. Awesome. Thank you so much. You are absolutely right. You know, previous events, we would be pretty met probably over a meal some uh, just before lunch or an early lunch before we jump into this panel session. Unfortunately, this is the situation today globally. Fortunately, we can still hear both your thoughts and opinion on important topics because of technology. Um, I would like to invite uh, Mr. Tavi to share a little bit about your background, uh, apart from the introduction I've done thus far, and then we will go into the questions. Yeah, uh, yeah. thank you for having me here. Uh, so uh, I'm an engineer. Uh, I've been building uh, different ICT solutions uh, uh, for my own country, for in private and public sector, also uh, like uh, countries here around Estonia. Uh, and globally, uh, I've been building up uh, different startups and, and development companies. And also, yes, I have been working as a, as a first chief information officer for my country, for Estonia. 
Uh, like, I really would like to salute India. Uh, thanks to Reliance Geo, I've been uh, involved uh, with Indian development and followed like what India is doing uh, last last uh, two three years, and uh, really like uh, great achievements. Long way to go still, but uh, at least compared with Germany or UK or or Canada or US, uh, your your basic is right. Like. Uh, so we have a very strong foundation like to build great uh, digital society on top of that. So um, I really admire that and, and the reforms you have made uh, during the last 10 plus years. Uh, yeah, so, uh, but like you can treat me as an engineer so I can, I can answer like very difficult technical questions if you want to. Thank you so much. We'll get straight into it. Today, citizens, expect public services to be as personalized and responsive as the services they get from the private sector. Yes, citizens are more demanding today. Governments need to reimagine how digital can be used to enhance the citizens end-to-end -end experience from public services. Is this a fair expectation from today's citizen? Dr. Javi, and then Mr. Tab. Uh, so yes, as um, uh, Dr. Tavi was speaking uh, about India, so we uh, personalization is we are on the journey of personalization. I think uh, India and the rest of the world looks at Estonia as a role model, and, there's no, and I think Estonia itself feels proud about the fact that we all first look at examples when we are starting on a project to look at Estonia because they, are, they must have done it and they must have done the first mover. So it becomes easy for the rest of the world to possibly, if I use the word copy or do something along those lines. So, so yes, so we are, uh, we are on the journey uh, and given the, the 1.4 billion population that becomes uh, a challenge for us. But I think the three things that have enabled and I think one of them uh, that, that Tavi focused was the internet connectivity. Uh, so we are. Uh, so we have a large rural population in India. So three things has been we have been working on for the last five six years. Uh, uh, what as we call them the jam trinity. So one is the bank account for every citizen. So a billion bank account is there for citizen, and they are uh, Jandhan bank account. It's a Hindi term. Uh, Jandhan means for the people's money. So J comes for that Jandhan bank account. So we have a billion plus Jandhan bank account. We have now, uh, oh, and this is a, another initiative that started around 2010 to 2012, is getting an unique identity. So previously, if you needed to, before 2012, if you needed to do anything, we would either show our passport or our driving license or some other ID card, office ID card, to, as a, a proof of citizenship and proof of anything. But now we have a unified ID, which is called the uni, uh, unique identity, uh, identity or the Aadhaar in, in India. So the A stands for the Aadhaar. So J, Jandhan, A for Aadhaar. And M is the part that uh, Tavi spoke about, is the mobile. So these three are linked to each other. So your uh, Jandhan account, your bank account is linked to your mobile number and your unique identity number is also linked to your mobile number. So, mobile, so, um, so the moment you, you give your mobile number, you can get access to the other two. It seems very, very simple, but I think operationally doing it for 1.3 billion population is the, is the biggest challenge. And we'll still have a couple of states in India where uh, the penetration of this is uh, not, uh, is below 90%. So, which means that, um, and this is uh, this service is once this three trinity, as we call them, the jam trinity, J A M, uh, is there. A lot of the government services, like if you are eligible for a certain discount or uh, you are eligible for certain uh, certain things from the government, that amount of money directly comes to your bank account. Given that you know a beneficiary and your beneficiary details are there and comes. Uh, in India, what has also happened is that the fintech revolution, the fintech revolution that is happening, we have, have a large uh, number of fintech payments. The moment I give my mobile number, you can transfer money to me. You don't need to know my bank account number, my SWIFT score or anything there. And remembering mobile numbers is much easier. So I think these are the type of things that, have, uh, that are really uh, moving now. And, there are, and, and the really interesting part is that um, 
government, uh, the way the role it wants to play is that it wants, it wants to provide the platform. So like given it the JAM platform, we have also the UPI platform, uh, Unified Payment Interface platform, which uh, on which everything that is there, as I told you, once you have your mobile number, it can be linked uh, to it. But what we really want and that is happening is that many fintech companies and other startups and also the big MNCs are coming and innovating on this platform and trying to come up with citizen deliverables. Because given that we have a large country and there are different um, variety of people and variety of needs across the country, government cannot do everything on its own. So it has to rely a lot on the market and the, and the market forces to come and innovate and come up with solutions. So I think that is the role that the government is trying to play in this case uh, with this uh, with these digital technologies. Thank you. Thank you. Starby, from an engineer's point of view, what do you think? I mean, uh, your question was like, is it fair to expect great services from the government, basically? Uh, I mean, I think my answer uh, will surprise you. It's not fair. Really? Why? Yeah. Uh, because, uh, like, uh, you first uh, need to understand, like, what kind of services government provides. Yes, I mean, like, let's say if you get the monthly pension or, like, uh, drug prescription and things like that, definitely this needs to be convenient and easy to use. And like, uh, it, should, you should, it just should land in your, in your bank account, let's say. Like. But uh, let's say, yeah, if you apply for a construction permit, how many houses you are building during your lifetime? One, two. Uh, how many uh, times you apply for a driving license? So, so those are the services that you actually use very rarely. And to expect like great uh, user experience from the service that you use very, very rarely, I mean, uh, it's not fair. Uh, yes, we all like Google, but go and try to manage your company profile and your users with Google. And if you don't do that every day, even though Google has those billions to invest into the UI and like self, same type of like look and feel and stuff, it's still complicated and annoying. So, uh, so we can't expect like something that we use very rarely to be very convenient and easy to understand. Yes, governments like uh, like should plan their services like in a way that it's it's easy to use, etc. But most of uh, most important, government needs to change the process and regulate regulation in a way that it could be fully automated. The process processes could be like I mean. Don't waste your citizens or companies' time to continuously ask the same information again, and again, and again. Like, like, get your data moving and like try to step away from the path of the companies to to basically contribute to your economy. That's your goal. But they never be. I mean, like, like applying for a construction permit will be as difficult like it was like uh, ten years ago. It will be in future. Yes, part of those will be automated. But the difficulty doesn't come from the information sharing. The difficulty comes from the fact that this thing is new for you. And it's new every time because every year you have a new issue with the government. And it's very rarely it's the same thing like uh, tax, like declaring taxes is something that you do every year. But even the thing that you do every year, it's not uh, comparable, let's say, with financial institutions where you transfer your money or like uh, you, trans you do transactions basically daily basis. So it's, it's not fair game. So there's, it's not fair expe expectation to have like as move as with Google. I mean, like give them give the same kind of money to me, like and I will build it uh, as, as Google will build it. Like so, so it's not fair. But then isn't it something that governments should strive to achieve? I mean, I pay my taxes every year. And in the last five years in Malaysia, our tax paying processes has gone digital. And it is actually really, really good. I mean, I do. Yeah. It. yeah. So, so, but shouldn't that be an aspiration that all governments strive towards? I mean, yeah, it's a goal, but uh, like I wanted to say, let's say taxis, and if you could, if you can fully automate the service, yes, you should do it. Obviously, you should do it. But my point is that, like, uh, it's impossible dream, uh, like that you actually have uh, everything running smoothly in all areas. And it's not because that you cannot do a digital service. Yes, you can do a digital service. The question is, like, uh, like if a topic is new, like building a house is a new topic for most of the people, like. If the, if the topic is new, they just don't feel confident. And you can't change that. Fair enough. But we shall still, as the citizen, we shall always hold our government 
to a higher standard. That's my firm belief. Next question. How do we create a more digital public workforce? Building a digital infrastructure is necessary to accelerate the digital drive of the government, but it can't sustain that momentum by itself. To your point, Mr. Tabi, building a digitally fluent workforce is equally essential. The pandemic highlighted the growing need for a tech-savvy, digitally literate public workforce. As a result, governments are driving efforts to raise the digital literacy of their staff. So how do we do more of that from a public services point of view? Mr. Tami, you will start with me. Uh, yeah, I mean, like, uh, for us, uh, we were part of uh, Soviet Union, uh, like, uh, 40 years, like, uh, and Soviet Union was very corrupted and, and uh, basically like a, like a cheaters, cheaters uh, society. And Estonia wanted to step away from that uh, very quickly. And uh, uh, politicians back then, they like to say that um, it's very hard to bribe a computer. So uh, if you replace, like in most cases, you replace a person with a machine, like it becomes more transparent and, and faster. and. Uh, understandable for the society. Um, so that was one of the drives Estonia had in 1990s uh, like to get where we are at the moment. And uh, uh, so, yes, uh, your office staff gets more literated and uh, obviously, like, uh, if you take new generations, they have been born with, with uh, different tools and devices. So uh, it gets better and better. But uh, the, the bureaucracy and corruption issue is still a thing. Like, uh, uh, like, like, it's not about that they cannot learn. It's because they don't want to learn. I mean, if I can get extra paid uh, to make uh, processes a little faster for certain people, like, uh, it's, a, it's a huge motivation. And like, uh, you can't get rid of that just like uh, digitalizing services. Like uh, you also have to change the motivation models. Like uh, you have to fight with corruption, et cetera. Like, so there are other motives that doesn't allow government and government officer to move on here faster compared with private sector. And it's not that they can't do the technology. Obviously they can, they just don't want to. Thank you, Dr. Avi. So I think Tavi uh, uh, talked about a very important point of corruption. And I think a lot of the work that is happening in India uh, on digitization is uh, with a motive of corruption. We don't have the luxury to part away <laughs> like Estonia <laughs> did, but uh, we are trying to change. I, I, I can tell you one incident, uh, two particular incidents. In my when I was a kid, uh, getting uh, buying a railway ticket. Very, very simple thing, buying a railway ticket for long distance travel, where say you travel for say uh, more than 12 hours or something, getting that ticket, buying the ticket, the process was very cumbersome. You have to go and stand in a queue. You have to bribe the touts who spend time from the morning standing. So you have to pay some bribe to stand in the queue. And then if you are just going, then you have to possibly go at four in the morning because the counter will open at eight in the morning. So there are things like that. Uh, whole process was very, very cumbersome because it was only a physical process. You could go into some fixed counters. So about 20 years back, uh, this thing was, uh, was digitized. And now uh, we can all buy tickets at the comfort of a home and this whole ecosystem of touts have gone away. So that's a major thing. Another thing is the passport, application for passports. Uh, that has become a really smooth, again, I think about 10, 15 years back, uh, this process is. Um, uh, when we talk, uh, we have a large rural population and a, and a population which is uh, below poverty line and they get certain benefits uh, from the state. And uh, when they say they get supposed to get 100 units of money, um, uh, the moment it reaches them, it, they possibly receive only 40 or 50 out of the 100. Uh, with, with, the, with the digital platform, as I was telling you, uh, you know a beneficiary, you know a beneficiary's mobile number, and the, and the person gets 100 units of money, irrespective of what they are. So the middlemen are all, all uh, removed in the, in the process. So a large part of our, uh, our digital efforts are to ensure, because you have to see this is a large country. So say a certain product or service is 
is create is uh, manufactured in one place and spread across the rest of the country so there will be about say uh, 10 to 20 middlemen in the process and the the thing is that everyone starts to get a share of it uh, so the a large number of dealer process where it is possible uh, we are trying to automate those aspects even now uh, just last month what i saw uh, uh, there are uh, there are people below poverty line who are um, who are eligible to get grains like they get rice and wheat grains and there are uh, vending machines this is a very recent thing that has come up in the last three months where you can enter your uh, uid number the unique identification number and you can get like everyone based on the number of family members you have you are eligible to a particular uh, amount of it so uh, so a lot of this automation is happening within and and uh, and that is actually helping us remove the corruption so so that was uh, a, a preclude to what javi was talking about but Talking about digital workforce, uh, I think I, I quite like the way um, you mentioned about Google doing it better. And I think I think in, in India also we uh, we believe that um, government cannot do all because our government is pretty huge. It's a it's, it's like the elephant, you, and it's, it's, it's it takes a long time to make the elephant dance possible. So you have to rely on private players. So a lot of the times we have these private players. IBM, uh, Microsoft, Google, Facebook, and, and even the smaller ones also coming and working with the government uh, in, in solving this problem. And there is a, there's an interest for them also because government uh, possibly has the money, but might not have the best know-how about how to solve the problem. So they can possibly pay in the fees uh, or the vendor fees, but then the expertise comes with them. So they bring the global expertise for uh, working in different places and, and then customize the solutions to India. It is there. They, uh, and in the process, there are some people who are there as a part of the system uh, who are also getting trained and it's, it's happening there. So it's, it's like uh, build, operate, and then transfer model. So they will the, the vendor mostly builds the thing and operates it for four or five years. And then after say five years or 10 years, depending on the complexity of solution, it then transfers it to a small team of the government. But there are very few things that we try to build from scratch because we understand um, with the government salary levels, uh, we cannot attract uh, uh, the best talents. Uh, and, and government salary levels are very difficult to change in India. <laughs> well, maybe the next wave. But I like to touch on a little bit on the public-private partnership that governments um, may be embarking on. And I'd like to hear a little bit on that experience uh, from Estonia's point of view when, when the whole digital transformation of the country started, Mr. Javi. What was the stand of the Estonian government with regards to public-private partnership? And where was, which area was the greatest strength for, for such a partnership and where it may not be so favorable? Uh, yeah, it's a great question. Like, uh, the honest answer is that uh, um, the, the, the engine of the digitalization definitely came from the private sector. And uh, uh, it was like uh, every like, huge change needs a pain. And then Estonia had a different kind of pain compared with uh, India. It was vice versa pain. Like uh, we have a pain having a huge amount of land but not too many people. Like so, it's a very uh, basically it's uh, like very hard to govern your country because you cannot have a government officer in every village, or you cannot have a, just just like you don't have enough people to serve other people. Like to to push people to use uh, self services, internet, etc. Came from the fact that uh, I mean, it's just not like too many people here. Like and. Uh, uh, like it's hard to understand in government perspective, but it's very easy to understand uh, from a uh, private sector uh, perspective because you can't have a bank office in every small city or, or town. Like it's not efficient economically. Like uh, and your goal is still make money and, and uh, earn profit. So uh, you need to push people to to uh, uh, use these digital tools. But on the same time, if everybody builds their own tools, it becomes very uh, like expensive. Like, like if you think about like all the banks building their tools, like uh, all the telcos building their tools, etc. So the question was like, can we standardize something? Like, can we share? Like, uh, basically, can we solve the 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 who is behind device question uh, jointly? And uh, so the private sector was very good. Um, uh, let's say. 
uh, definer of the needs and government just needed to uh, listen and, and, and make the change happen. Like, uh, and it happened together with, uh, with the private sector. So uh, Estonia builds everything from scratch. Uh, so we don't buy anything basically from IBM or, or Microsoft, except like uh, obviously the application servers or like the databases, but, uh, but the applications themselves, we, we, we build ourselves, but we don't uh, build it inside the government. So 95% it's actually private sector that develops those systems uh, for the government and they all have a right to resell those, those tools to other countries if they want to. Uh, so, but the government doesn't have any programmers on, 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 on payroll. Uh, so uh, we have like, um, like our goal and model has been like, you can't build a digital society like as a government, like you have to do it like as, as, a, as a private public partnership uh, and you have to listen both sides of the market and then basically develop all of the, the things according to that, especially government like putting place the policies and, uh, and standards. For example, our like most of our digital uh, tools, like for let's say who is behind device, like all the mobile IDs, smart IDs, things like that, they're all private sector provided, but they are provided according to the law and standards. And that's important. Yeah. Thank you. Dr. Avid, would you have anything else to add on to this? So I, think, I think this is a very, very correct thing. So if you see my experience, particularly before I joined the government of India, uh, I had worked in consulting, uh, both with Accenture and IBM, uh, myself. And I had worked extensively in particularly three countries, uh, Singapore, Malaysia, and Indonesia. And, and a little bit in Australia also. Um, but then when I, uh, so when you see these companies, uh, they bring that global exp expertise. So if you have built a, a solution for say tax payment and you have the experience for three different countries, you know what, what work, what doesn't work. And having that experience actually saves a lot of time of failure and iterations and stuff. I think this global expertise is required because government in a certain country, they are doing administration on a day-to-day -day basis. They might not know what sort of IT solutions or digital solutions will work. Global expertise and this partnership model is very much important for the success. And it, I think it's also ecosystem. If they don't get, get businesses from government, how will they survive? If everyone says all hospitals start doing their IT, if all governments start doing their IT themselves, then the IT companies will go bust. <laughs> so the ecosystem will not run. Agreed. 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 So understanding and underpinning all this is obviously data. Right. So I'm going to move into a few data questions. How, how do we leverage a shared data model and support an open and transparent data infrastructure across the government and its, all its agencies and actors? Um, Dr. Tavi? Oh, sorry, Mr. Tavi, sorry. Um, so we have a, like, a very... Um, core principles put in place um, uh, 15, 20 years ago. And uh, uh, so we wanted to follow the principle of single source of truth. So by law, uh, government is not allowed to collect the same kind, of, same kind of information from the citizen or from the companies twice. So uh, if I already, as a citizen, have presented my data like to one institution, like, and if the other institution needs the same data, they cannot ask it me, it's illegal. They have to take it from the original source. And uh, so basically you remove duplication from the system and uh, it actually creates, uh, makes your system more cyber secure, right? Because uh, the fact that systems get hacked is a fact. I mean, even like the great countries uh, cannot avoid that, uh, which means that uh, uh, you will lose data. And the question is like, how to minimize the damage? So for example, if you uh, hack Estonian uh, car database, then uh, yes, you can get like uh, the understanding which cars are driving uh, in Estonian, on Estonian roads, but who owns what car, uh, that link can, you cannot make because like uh, uh, the owner's information is in the population registry. So you have to hack that also. Uh, so one thing why it's good is from cybersecurity perspective, but uh, I think most important is that uh, uh, having the fact that every silo, every department can only collect 
data what they need and doesn't exist everywhere else uh, gives uh, dependencies and very high expectations on, on data quality. And we struggled with that 20 years ago, like databases were full of uh, like zeros or full of crap, like, uh, but if others start to depend on your data, they start whining, like, okay, like, uh, I cannot collect my data by myself. I need to rely on your data by law, but your data is shit, like make it correct. And then I can basically rely on that. Like, uh, and this is the self-cleaning like system. Like, so uh, so the air or water becomes clean by by itself because of this, this dependencies. Like, uh, because if nobody looks inside inside the silo, like uh, government officers are extremely like I'll say capable to create whatever uh, like they have in mind, and nobody controls it because it's very hard to control it, etc. But if other depend on you, like. Uh, like the, the work you haven't done, it will be revealed and it's a shame. And that's one thing that government officers are afraid. They, they're afraid of shame. Yes, fantastic. So I, was, I think that's a great idea. Dr. Avik. Yes, yeah, so, um, so open data is, is something that is of huge interest to, to me. And, and currently, if you see also one of the major activity which I'm working on is the open in the, in the India data portal. Um, and there have been initiatives on open data in India because the country, I think, uh, unlike Estonia, we realized around 2010 or 12 that data and data sharing is very important uh, for transparency, policy making, and for. Oh, sorry, I got mute. And and since then, uh, uh, since then, uh, uh, there has been a portal for open data. Uh, but then that is has not been continuously been updated. So and also what happens is that when uh, when data is uh, is uh, shared, data is shared in a in a manner uh, that some uh, some people makes it available in machine readable format, uh, say a CSV or an API. Some might put it as a on a page web page, and some might put it as a PDF file. Uh, or something that cannot be automatically read. So um, it becomes very difficult for people in the ecosystem to get the data and do analysis of, of that. So there are uh, efforts by us and multiple people to bring the, the data on a machine readable format that can be easy for analysis. So that's uh, one of the effort that we are working on. Uh, but then uh, this is what the data I'm talking about, the central level data, the federal level data, which is at a very high level. But if you go to the individual states, they also collect a lot of data. Uh, and there are several states about say, out of the 35 states in India, 36 states in India, uh, about 10 to 12 states have started their own open data portal. An open data portal, basically what they're doing is that they are putting all aspects of their state on the public domain. So say if they had uh, things like how many uh, cars moved to a particular platform a junction on that last day, what is the level of water in a particular reservoir? Uh, how many people collected uh, some uh, public distribution system uh, food grains in the in the last uh, few days uh, and, a, and a range of things. So the, so the number of indicators that they're putting is actually uh, very, uh, 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 very, very good. And that's actually helping them, uh, uh, them come a lot and citizens are coming to know about these aspects, but then we are only in the journey. I think there's a lot more to be done uh, on the open data aspect. Yes. Yeah, if so, I, now we wanted to talk, yes. I just wanted to add like an interesting um, uh, phenomenon. Uh, open data and digitalization actually creates uh, more benefits to the large societies. Because uh, let's say hospital systems are the same in, in compared with say with India or like with Estonia, like you still need to register a patient, you treat the patient, etc. Like uh, you uh, write pre uh, prescriptions and stuff. Uh, so the system needs to be built are the same. The question is the scale, uh, but the scale comes in both ways. Like yes, it's hard to implement. It's uh, that's that's like the sad part. But let's say the benefit from one transaction. And if you have like huge amount of transactions, the cost of one transaction goes down, especially for the large, larger countries and larger populations. And the open data seems to be working better in, in the larger societies because uh, there is an interest like, uh, like, like to make, to basically build services on top of that. 
But one thing we, we noticed with, with COVID, actually we noticed that before because we started our collaboration with Novartis and some other um, pharmaceutical companies uh, uh, already more than 10 years ago, is the fact that, uh, I mean, Estonia has our own language. Uh, so we, we speak Estonian. And, uh, and uh, if you build your systems to be very convenient for a doctor or for a nurse or for a patient, so uh, that's one angle. But uh, suddenly uh, I discovered, let's say 10 years later, but uh, this data is not uh, transferable to the pharmaceutical companies. So, uh, and that hit it very hard, let's say in, in a COVID where uh, uh, basically for Pfizer, uh, uh, Israel was the number one uh, country to be uh, uh, to work with, but uh, Estonia was also in that list. But uh, you, like, it's, it's very important that you set your data standards and like, uh, basically like make your data valuable so it could be included into the international uh, international studies and to be used internationally so that was one of the mistakes Estonia made already when we when we started and we still struggle with that problem awesome so you know with all this talk about data I'm, I'm just gonna hear a little bit in terms of the trust between the government and the citizenry so one of the biggest problems that we experience in terms of implementing with an e-government digital effort is how the citizenry may be skeptical in providing their personal information because of a fear of it being misused, um, you know, the, the big eye in the sky, me being watched all the time. How do you tackle this uh, issue? Uh, we'll start with uh, Dr. Avi and then we'll move on to Mr. Chavi. Well, that's a very controversial issue that you bring in. So, so India, um, so uh, India is in the process of uh, framing its data privacy bill or law. So we had the draft uh, came out in 2018, uh, but then um, it has gone through uh, multiple round of debates, and it has not become a bill yet. It is still in the in the, in the draft phase for three years still now. So, so you can understand uh, there are multiple uh, uh, groups of people who looks at it from different points of view. Like say there are, uh, it's, it's, it's along the line of GDPR, uh, like uh, the people that data has been collected by the government or any other entity, maybe it's Facebook or Google, what they can do with the data, you know, what, are, what will happen if the data is leaked. Uh, what the, what will happen if the data is misused other than what has been mentioned. So this is a, a lot uh, coming there. Uh, but then uh, these are all discussions at the moment. Given that bill has not come out, um, we do not have a definitive thing yet. Uh, Tavi mentioned a very nice thing about sharing of, uh, of uh, private data, like say from Novartis or Pfizer. I think that is, we have not reached that level yet. Uh, where private parties in India actually agree to share their data. Um, we have had discussions with some of them and some of them for very uh, specific things they might have shared. But as a practice, say, um, you know, some hospitals, some private hospitals sharing the numbers of how many patients came there for with what sort of disease at an aggregate level, not at a patient level. That mechanism is is not in not in place, and also we uh, you know, there has been a lot of discussion because we also need this data for the development of AI uh, in the country. We need the more granular level data, which needs to be annotated definitely, annotated and also anonymized uh, before they can be used for AI purposes. Uh, but then the first step is is sharing the data. But uh, I think that's uh, our journey that we have been talking about. Uh, that if you can get data which the hospitals have stored for the last 20 years, some amount of patient data, and we ensure that they are completely anonymized and, and can be used for some machine learning and artificial intelligence purposes, that will be really good. Um, but we are still in the journey. We have not solved the puzzle yet. Uh, and and, uh, and I was saying, um, we need some laws and regulations also in the country for doing that. And till the data privacy law comes in, uh, and no one else can also take up uh, first step in that direction. So it's like a chicken and egg problem that we are we are stuck in for the last three years. Yeah, it's not a chicken and egg problem. It's, it's a great example of, of mixing mixing politics and engineering. And, uh, 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 so, uh, like, I mean, 
if you like, if you clearly think about it, like without any uh, populism, etc., like uh, it's um, it's not like sense. I mean, it's, it's not even reasonable, like that people are so co like cautious about their like privacy and and like they're concerned about giving data to the government, and, and at the same time, like they are like uh, like willing to basically reveal their like uh, like DP secrets. To the Google, Facebook, etc. I mean, like, what kind of porn you're watching? Like, uh, uh, what what kind of like uh, health? I mean, in most cases, Google knows your your medical problems first before your doctor. So why you are so concerned about your medical data? Like, and, and I, 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 you got uh, basically there is no reasonable ex explanation like about all those big problem fairs, etc. But yes, I mean, let's assume they are there. Uh, uh, Estonia and like the, basically the whole Scandinavia, the North European part, has solved that already 20 years ago. And uh, so before GDPR was in place, uh, those countries had a rule that uh, uh, people have a right to uh, understand like what, what data you collect about uh, myself and what, what purpose, etc. And uh, uh, basically, yes, all the doctors can access my patient records in Estonia. But I also can see who has accessed my data. And now if I see that the person name that I cannot recognize, uh, I can make a query. Why this person look at my data? If there is no meaningful explanation, this person goes to jail. And that's how you basically, like, now one day, everybody has an access to data. You make data useful. But you, on the same time, you have very strict rules that if you misuse that data if you pass it to the third person it's a journalist i mean start packing you are going to jail for many years like anyway i mean uh, it, it depends on judge like for one year or for three years but you are going so start packing so like anyway you are going so 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 those are the, those are the mechanisms that you, you can actually make make things work but, but 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 yes it's very simple to make and use force with your own people and your own systems let's say if you are like uh uh, I mean, I can force like Estonian hospitals or like like uh, like nurses or, or doctors. Not me, but let's say like the laws can force. But can we force Facebook? Can we go after like uh, Zuckerberg? No. And that's where you mix the politics and like uh, and, and engineering. The GDPR uh, law in Europe is great law. It's it, I'm 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 a, I'm a big fan of GDPR. Execution of GDPR? Where? I mean, have we like penalized like uh, Facebook? Do people know that they actually record like whatever we say here at the moment? I, are we happy with that? If you're happy, I mean, like, why are you so concerned about your own country like getting data? I mean, the the government has like a very limited view about you. Like, okay, I know what property you own, but like, you need you you want me to know that because that helps you to protect that property, not stealing from you. Yes. What car you own, etc. Like so, this, that data actually protects you. And at the same time, like you are talking about, like privacy in the time of Google and and, and my Facebook, or like like TikTok and others. I mean, let's not mix politics and engineering. Yes, that's true. Fair enough. <laughs> I like fair. your points. Yes. <laughs> Such an eye-opening session. Unfortunately, it's going to have to come to a close soon. So I have one last question for each of you, and then we will have to move to closing. So for Dr. Avi, we have a question asking, tell us about the intention, challenges, and the success story of AHA, because AHA has become such a massive uh, word for digitization in government and digital ID. So do share your, your thoughts. Yes, so, so this was a, the, uh, we didn't have any social security number or any unique identification number as I started with in the beginning. Like people used to give uh, either a driving license, voter ID card or passport as ID. So this has now over the years, uh, since we have started in 2012, um, in the last five, six years, it has become the unique ID uh, that everyone is using. And it has now been linked to a lot of the other services also. Uh, it's, it's voluntary in nature. For some of the things, it is mandatory. Like if you're filing tax, uh, your mobile phone, it is mandatory. But for many other things, it is only, only voluntary. But given that you, uh, if you link it, it helps you, um, it helps you uh, uh, 
your helps your process becomes much more smoother so if i have to get some refund for my taxes and i have just given my aadhar number there whatever refund i get at the end of uh, filing my taxes it comes directly to my bank account i don't have to fill additionally my bank account details or anything so so that way it it, it really helps uh, helps a lot and it's it's really helped a lot in the in in linking the beneficiaries understanding who is eligible for what and and and, and those aspects um getting this id for a 1.4 billion is has been a a, a very challenging journey but i think this has been one of the the big success uh, to link it uh, to get aadhar and i think uh, what has really changed aadhar and given it a new dimension is the linking to the mobile number which even again happened because of the of the internet access and the mobile telephony access uh, that has penetrated the country in the last 5 years so and 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 now what is also we are seeing is Uh, is the fintech revolution so so one by one so so aadhar is the sort of the layer platform first we have seen the mobile phone layer now we have the fintech layer and i am i am hoping that over the next 10 years we will see many more services been linked to aadhar um, as like say we have something called a digital locker it has been there as a, uh, for the last 5 6 years but it has not become hugely popular but i think aadhar can so uh, till now if i have to go somewhere if i am say taking uh, admission in a college i have to carry on my certificate if i have to go to a doctor i have to carry on my medical record what digital locker allows you it's a very common concept across the world is that all the records that you want to sh- uh, share with others stays in a single place linked to your aadhar number and your mobile phone and whoever you want to give access uh, can access it directly from there so i think this will make lives uh, much more easier um, and and help the citizen but again i think we are we are still in the journey and again we also rely a lot on the private players to uh, to come and innovate and they also have to see one important thing that doing this thing is it beneficial and profitable for them till they find that uh, a sector is not profitable for them they will not enter that sector so that's a that's a challenge too of course but um i i note in recent times especially how your fintech ecosystem has really reaped the benefit of aadha um and and the benefits of aadha so to mr tavi sorry if i if i may comment that like oh. uh, uh Uh, I I also would like to salute to Adhar, uh, especially. Uh, I mean, again, like uh, if you look at this from the engineering perspective, if you have two different systems, if you want them, like you, you both have like some information about the citizen, and if you want like to connect those systems, they have to have the same unique identifier. A name is not unique identifier, like especially in India. Like, come on. <laughs> so. Uh, So, so, so you 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 need some kind of like uh, like a code. Like uh, it doesn't have to be numbers. It can be letters. Like 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 your email is unique identifier. Like your mo- mobile number is unique identifier. Like uh, so so it's a technological thing, and and still like uh, very advanced countries refuse to accept that digital times need digital names. That you can't be John like Miller everywhere. Like it's a John Smith everywhere. It doesn't work. So, so you need unique identifiers, and and the fact that India understood that and 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 uh, basically accepted the impossible challenge, like to roll it out to 1.4 billion people, like is it's astonishing. The same thing, like you can't make all the silos talk with each other, like uh, like Estonia did. Like yes, here our uh, that the fact that we are smaller, like we we benefited from that, so it was like easier for us to reform that. and and the fact that like people themselves like citizens themselves become let's say uh data transporters basically two silos cannot talk with each other but they both can talk with my locker like so i become the delivery element like so it's just like uh part of the longer journey it's an evolution so they will end up with the fact that those two silos will talk with each other directly but for for time being for next 10 years it's a great solution like how to move forward and uh to be honest like i was uh, amazed by the supreme court decision that doesn't allow to use aadhaar everywhere freely that was actually from my perspective it wasn't a very wise decision uh but now it moves back like i think it's moving out like uh, because the societies and uh, for example china like uh the 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 societies who have understood that you need to have that you have to treat this unique identifier not like a secret number it's your name your digital name 
and it's your call like how to use it where you want to use it like uh, so i can tell you here in this presentation also that my name is not tavi but my name is john smith and it doesn't change much like but if i like want to basically like connect data from, from different sources i have to have a unique identifier and to understand that will be a challenge for most of the country for the next 10 years you don't have well, that in your no, I think after the, now that you mentioned the Supreme Court, so after the Supreme Court judgment, what has also happened is that there is the Aadhaar number, but they now have come up with another link number with every Aadhaar number, which is for sharing. So Yeah, but this is uh, basic. Yeah, but small like, step. Again, like from the engineering perspective, you just made the simple thing more complicated and more yes, costly, yes. but the outcome is the same. Yes, so if I, uh, I don't know if I can show yeah. my... I, 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 I'm, I'm familiar with the system, so I know that. Okay. So, so my point is that, like, uh, you, you always can make it like things simple, like they were before Supreme Court. Like it was actually cheaper and faster before that. Like now it's more yes. complicated, but it's still doable. Yes, yes. But it's not doable, let's say, in Japan with my number. <laughs> <laughs> Such a rich discussion. Unfortunately, I have to draw it to a close. But one final question for Mr. Javi with regards to. In order to set up an excellent e-governance, where would you start? Where do where do people start? Uh, I just did presentation before this session. Uh, I think on the slide uh, four, there is a list of actions you need to do. Just look at the slide. Okay, thank you. Do 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 mail it to me also. I also have a look. <laughs> <laughs> yes, do share it on email to all. To all. Yes, yes. Thank okay. you so much to my wonderful, wonderful panelists. It's been an exciting and actually interesting session, even for myself. And I hope everybody out there has enjoyed um, the banter and the uh, question and answers. I'd like to pass the time now over to our MC, if she will return back to the room. <laughs> Thank you very much, Tavi and Dr. Avik, dialing in from different parts of the world and bringing forth their vast experience in the honest and candid sharing session we just heard. And Jasmine, thank you so much for the great job moderating as well. We truly hope that all of you watching have found this session useful. Let us know your thoughts in the survey available as your feedback is valuable to us. As Tavi mentioned, do replay back and check out his slide, I believe slide number four. All of the sessions that we have presented today as well as yesterday will be available for you to watch on the website as well. Now, we shall take a short break before we commence with the second half of our program at 2 p.m. Do join us for the next session as we have, I believe, the youngest speaker ever on the MTM platform at only seven years of age and he will surely leave you at all. Now, remember, to fill up the survey so that we can hear your thoughts and serve you better. The meeting and chat rooms are also available for your networking experience. Enjoy your lunch and we'll see you back at 2pm.